Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. It's a delight to be back in the pulpit at Grove. Uh, it's becoming more and more frequent. And, uh, it's not getting any easier. <laughs> it's a joy to be up here. It truly is. <clears throat> Would you pray? Well, before I begin, I'm going to be doing the New Testament reading in just a moment. But I'm going to open with some other words first. So don't get... Last time I did that... My liturgist and my wife both panicked, thought I'd forgotten all about reading it. I'm not forgetting it. I'm skipping it for the moment. Let us pray. These are the words in my mouth. These are what I chew on and pray. Accept them when I place them on the morning altar, O God, my altar rock, God, priest of my altar. You know, we don't often hear sermons using the book of Revelation as its basis. And there's good reason for that. I'll admit to you that I have never tried too, under, too hard to understand the book of Revelation. In fact, when I have read the book of Revelation, or parts of it I can't admit to ever reading straight through, my mind takes off in all sorts of directions. And we get caught up in numbers. There's 12 of this and 7 of that and 6 of this. And it just goes on and on and on. And it's difficult to discern what is it that God had in mind when he had John write this, this book. I know there are preachers who can raise fire and brimstone at the drop of a hat and use revelation to hammer home the point. The only time that I can ever recall hearing a sermon from Revelation was in a small community church in Daleville, Alabama. For those of you who don't know Daleville, it's the metropolis outside the main gate of Fort Rucker, Alabama, the home of Army Aviation. <laughs> Daleville is about three hours from Birmingham by phone. <laughs> anyway, we couldn't find any Presbyterian or Methodist churches down there, so we took the kids and went to the only Protestant church we could find. And I'll tell you the damnation of hell and the mercy of heaven were preached mightily that morning. <laughs> Our son Frank was four or five years old then, and when we left the church, he looked up at me and he asked, Daddy? Why was that man mad at me? <laughs> well, I don't plan to holler at you this morning, and I assure you I won't be threatening damnation of hell. If you would, before we get into this book of Revelation, put on your construction or architect hats for a moment. Now consider what your dream house would look like. If you have an unlimited budget for materials and furnishings, how would you build it? What location would you choose to build it? How would it look on the inside? How would it look on the outside? God has already built that house for us. We are promised a home in heaven that makes all earthly homes look like a used refrigerator box. As we read the passage from Revelation, consider the kinds of building materials God might have used. Our New Testament lesson today is from Revelation 21, <clears throat> verses 1 through 7 and 10 through 27. You can find it on page 1937, 1937, of your pew Bible if you wish to fill it along. 21, starting with 1. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Now the dwelling of God is with men, and he will live with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning, or crying, or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. He who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. Then he said, write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. He said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To who, him who is thirsty, I will give drink without cost from the spring of the water of life. He who overcomes will inherit all this, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. Then picking up with verse 10. 
And he carried me away in the spirit to a mountain great and high and showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God. It shone with the glory of God and its brilliance was like that of a very precious jewel, like a jasper, clear as crystal. It had a great high wall with 12 gates and with 12 angels at the gates. On the gates were written the names of the 12 tribes of Israel. There were three gates on the east, three on the north, three on the south, and three on the west. The wall of the city had 12 foundations, and on them were the names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. The angel who talked with me had a measuring rod of gold to measure the city, its gates, and its walls. The city was laid out like a square, as long as it is wide. He measured the city with the rod and found it to be 12,000 stadia in length and as wide and high as it is long. He measured its wall, and it was 144 cubits thick by man's measurement, which the angel was using. The wall was made of jasper and the city of pure gold, as pure as glass. The foundation of the city walls were decorated with every kind of precious stone. The first foundation was jasper, the second sapphire, the third chalcedony, the fourth emerald, the fifth sardonyx, the sixth carnelian, the seventh chrysolite, the eighth beryl, the ninth topaz, the tenth chrysoprase, the eleventh jacinth, and the twelfth amethyst. The twelve gates were twelve pearls, each gate made of a single pearl. The great street of the city was of pure gold, like transparent glass. I did not see a temple in the city, because the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. The city does not need the sun or the moon to shine on it, for the glory of God gives it light, and the Lamb is its Lamb. The nations will walk by its light, and the kings of the earth will bring their splendor into it. On no day will its gates ever be shut, for there will be no night there. The glory and honor of the nations will be brought into it. Nothing impure will ever enter it, nor will anyone who does what is shameful or deceitful but only those whose names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you. Thank you. I can't imagine the beauty and glory of this heaven. In the fourth chapter of Revelation, John told us about his first clue and impressions of heaven. One author called it a spiritual photo album prepared by the Apostle John. I love that. A spiritual photo album prepared by the Apostle John. But we can use John's revelation of what awaits us to prompt our wonder and praise to God. What will we believers do in heaven? Later in the book of Revelation, John tells us that we will reign with Christ. We will enjoy a relationship with God and with people from past ages. This marvelous holy city, John tells us, is perfectly square and is 1,400 miles on each side. That's a translation from what you heard earlier. And the walls are 200 feet high. That city's a bit larger than Amity. <laughs> John tells us about the city being built of jasper and gold and precious gems. We also learn here that the 12 gates were built with 12 pearls and that the main street is paved with gold. Now this is the foundation for us getting to the pearly gates and streets paved with gold. While on the subject of things we have heard about all our lives, why will St. Peter be sitting there checking us in as though we were in a great hotel? In Matthew 16, 19, Jesus tells us, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. The book of Revelation is the only book of the Bible that attempts to tell us about the physical characteristics of heaven. Heaven is mentioned hundreds of times throughout the Bible. We are told that there is a heaven. We're told how to get there and whom we will see. We are assured in several spots that we will go to heaven. But John's description from his dream is the only account of what the physical heaven would look like. Now all our lives we've heard tales and descriptions that have been passed down through the ages. But if we think about it, we know that those are just dreams or fictional accounts. 
We hear about near-death experiences wherein the patient talks about a great light and superb peace. We know that Jesus ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father. What we don't know is what it will really be like. We have an idea that there will be an everlasting peace, but how do we know that? We have all heard and maybe even said, well, it beats the alternative. back hurts really badly. Well, it beats the alternative. I think I'm surviving cancer, but it beats the alternative. Next time you're tempted to say that, pause. Think about that statement. I don't know anyone who's tried the alternative and come back to tell me that some ache, pain, or illness is better. As a believing Christian, I don't think that the malady of the day actually beats what I think and believe that heaven does represent. As a believer, I have to feel strongly that my aches and pains will be left behind. I believe that I will be in Jesus and God's presence. I do believe that I am headed to a better place. Do you? We have all been to any number of funerals and viewings where we go to pay our respects. Someone always says, and Gertrude's at peace now, or Aunt Gertrude's suffering is over. Or God has called Aunt Gertrude home. Funerals start with a phrase such as, we are here to mourn Gertrude's passing, but to celebrate her life. I attended a funeral at an AME church where the pastor said, we're here for Gertrude's homecoming. Now I dearly hope none of you have an Aunt Gertrude that's in trouble. <laughs> How do we know that we're going to heaven? Well, the simple answer is because the Bible tells us so. What more do we need? Truly, what else do we need? In the 11th Psalm that Edith read to us, we heard, For the Lord is righteous. He loves justice. Upright men and women will see his face. Upright men and women will see his face. This is the ultimate element of faith. There are lots of things that we take by faith to be true. God's very existence, sending his son to die for us, that we are pardoned of all our sins. But the faith that God has a dwelling place in heaven for us is the end all to end all for us. There is a hereafter, and we're going there. There is a hereafter, and that's what we're here after. <laughs> our choir has done a piece by Joseph Martin called Go Into the Holy City. Maybe we can ask Carl to add it again this fall. At any rate, it tells us about going to the Holy City, heaven. And I've now found that a lot of it comes from the book of Revelation. Joseph Martin knew his Bible well. There are any number of old spirituals that talk to being lifted from the drudgery of day-to-day -day life and crossing the Jordan, or going home, or going to heaven. Our tradition is based on the simple truth that there is a heaven, and we all get to go there. Think a minute about the, about the vision you might have of heaven. We all have the same vision of God sitting on his throne with Jesus at his right hand. But I mean, think of what you conjured up when you first started to think of this heaven. Probably need to think back to your childhood. Many years ago for some of us. I always thought of it being up there. But why? I guess it's because we always associate it with Jesus ascending to heaven. But really, we ascend to higher office, higher positions at work. But we might just move down the hall. But we've ascended. After learning to be a pilot, I actually got up there, penetrated those clouds, and I didn't see heaven. So where is this heaven? Well, I don't think it matters much. Not where heaven or hell for that matter are actually located. God knows, and that's all that matters. I fully expect that John's description of a huge walled city made of precious metals and jewels will be exactly what we'll see when we get there. I guess I kind of look at all the great paintings of folk like Michelangelo 
help me form some sort of visual of this place. But the actual vision, visual is another of those things we'll have to wait to actually find out. I would imagine all of you have heard or read some version of the story of the person who asked to have a fork in his or her hand when laid out in a casket. And some of those are very long, particularly if they've come by email or pages in length. And they drag you out and drag you out for a fairly simple punchline. When asked about the fork, the husband or wife or pastor answers that Aunt Gertrude wanted to have the fork because every time she went to a church supper or banquet, when it came time to collect the dishes, someone would say, keep your fork because the best is yet to come. At that dinner, they were talking about the homemade chocolate layer cake or a divinity pudding, or maybe even Mary's cherry pie, or some other absolutely delightful dessert. Of course, Aunt Gertrude wanted to keep her fork in the casket because she was heading to heaven, the best that could possibly come. Deep down, we all know that we will get to heaven. We have that faith and expectation that has been nurtured in us from our earliest days. For me, I'm keeping my fork. <laughs>